Hello, everyone. We've got a big crowd here today. Uh, just making sure everyone pops up. This is um, the 16th Cine Youth Film Festival. Uh, my name is Ryan Saunders. I'm the festival director here at Cine Youth. And I'm really thrilled to be welcoming all these filmmakers for the Up Past Bedtime Horror Program. Um, I came dressed uh, for, you know, in the spirit of the season and or at least the, just the season of horror that for, for me and I'm sure many of the filmmakers here is all year, we're all uh, big horror fans. Um, so yeah, what I'm gonna do uh, to get started is I'm just gonna have everyone introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their film. Um, so we'll sort of just like go around. I'll start with, um, we've got two Maxes here today. So I'll start with Max for Hollow. Hey, um, I'm Max. Yeah, my film is called Hollow. Uh, it stars my sister. It's black and white, four by three, um, sort of experimental about her being a investigator and going to a house in which a murder recently occurred. Uh, I didn't make that incredibly clear in the film um, due to limited resources, but that is the idea. So she goes to this house and then weird stuff starts to happen. And yeah, that's what the film's about. I'm glad it wasn't made clear because I think your film, one of the central appeals is it has all these mysteries to it. And that's why like it sort of infected my brain after I watched it. Um, it is very vague, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, similarly, a film that really grabbed hold of my brain. Um, the We've got two filmmakers here, co-directors for Blue Zenith. So Nathan and Jock, if you could introduce yourself and your film. Um, can you hear me? I don't know if my mic's working again. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm Nathan. I'm a fourth year at the University of Chicago. Um, and the film that we made is called Blue Zenith. And it's about a guy named Gregory who has a fascination with eels, uh, so much so that he wants to become an eel. And I th yeah, I guess Jacques can talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> I think you said it perfectly. It's a guy that wants to be an eel and, and strives to become an eel and I'm, I'm Jacques. I'm also a fourth year at the University of Chicago. Great, thank you both so much for being here. We also have Rain um, with her dog Gizmo. I see and he kind of hopped to the background now, but um, good to see Gizmo here too. Uh, but yeah, if you could introduce your film. Yeah, uh, so my film is called Swipe Right for Murder. And it follows, so the main character is a reclusive crime novelist whose best friend really wants her to get out there more. She sets her, she puts her on an online dating website to set her up with her soulmate. But because of her interest, her soulmate just so happens to be a serial killer that she ends up on a date with. I hate when that happens. <laughs> um, and now we have, so to our next Max, if you could talk about your film Wendigo. Uh, hi, my name is Max. I uh, created the film Wendigo, which is a animated horror film kind of set up in the woods of North America. Um, yeah, it's pretty heavily influenced by uh, films like The Shining and stuff, um, which I'm a big fan of. Yeah, that's certainly apparent in the film. Um, Ella, uh, who's a returning cine youth filmmaker, if you could talk about your new film Pogo. Hi, I'm Ella. My film Pogo is just basically uh, a short like about John Wayne Gacy because uh, I had a project to do a film about like a real life person. So I chose to do John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> Great. He's certainly uh, an, an enigmatic figure and it was exciting to, to see your film about him. And then last but not least, we have Naish for the film Taming Kara, if you could introduce yourself. Well, hi, I'm Naish. Uh, my film is called Taming Kara. Um, just basically follows a hunter and her assistant who go and catch this thing, <laughs> and um, and then the hunter starts to turn into an animal herself. Um, yeah. I also hate when that happens to me when I start turning into the creatures I'm hunting. <laughs> um, Let's uh, let's start with let's start with Damien Kara. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that creature, the the Tokolosh, and just sort of like the the folklore surrounding that, um, and possibly I guess if you what sort of research you might have done um, pulling from that folklore for your film. Okay, so that Tokolosh 
uh, creature is based on um, uh, Southern African folklore. Uh, the word itself literally translates to goblin. So <laughs> it's sort of an African version of that. Um, uh, but there are many variations. So the one we we went with, uh, the one I found most interesting was the Mozambican ones, which um, are speckled and they glow in the dark. Um, quite frightful little things. Um, yeah, so we went with that. I think we wanted a sort of mythical creature so that uh, to sort of support the whole fantasy side of it, that, yes, it could sort of inflict this on her. Um, yeah, but that's where uh, basically where it came from. Okay, so I guess, you know, you sort of answered this then, but I, I, f I feel I bring it up, the, the glowing element. So that was specifically the Mozambican, like, version of the Tokolosh. That's where the glowing idea came from and the, like, black light paint. Yeah, exactly. Great. Well, yeah, it certainly has an incredibly exciting, you know, visual look to it. Um, so another film that deals with folklore in this program is uh, Max's film Wendigo. And Max, I was wondering if you could talk about that, just um, your research process for reading about the Wendigo and how you sort of gave it your own spin for the film. Yeah, well, so uh, the Wendigo is sort of a like a Native American uh, sort of spirit of the woods. And there's loads, there's like loads of different sort of stories all around the US about it. And some are like, you know, cannibalism and stuff. Um, yeah, but so I had this sort of idea for like this um, house up in the woods that sort of gets um, sort of haunted by the Wendigo or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, we, we spoke a little bit about this before coming in and um, I remember when I first watched your film and I saw that you were from Ireland, I was so surprised because I was so certain when I went to check the location after watching it, I thought, oh, this guy's from Minnesota or he's from Wisconsin because you perfectly capture specifically like a, a Midwestern United States like attitude of the North Woods. Um, and so you mentioned in your, we have filmmakers send fun facts and you had said you're half Irish, half Wisconsin. So I was wondering if you could talk about that influence of, you know, having family in Wisconsin and how that influences your art. Yeah, well, my dad's from the U.S. and uh, he's he's lived in Wisconsin, um, like he's raised there. And so, yeah, we travel over there quite a bit. And uh, the the sort of landscape is so vastly different from what we're used to over here in Ireland, which is just sort of, you know, flat fields and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I was really just, um, I, I really love particularly like dense woods and, you know, mountains and stuff. And um, yeah, a few Google Google Earth trips to uh, Alaska um, kind of helped me to get a feel for how it should look and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, you know, something I was curious about too, so I'm glad you, you touched on that was, yeah, it feels very Midwestern and yet there are all these mountains. Um, so the, the Alaska connection is, that's quite funny. That's nice. It's, it's, it's a unique space in your film. Um, Ella, I wanted to talk a little bit about, so you said this was, uh, your film was like a response to a project that you were like, you were assigned about making a film about a, a, a historical figure or just like a figure in culture. Um, so John Wayne Gacy, uh, could you talk about why you were drawn to that story and why you wanted to make a film about him? I wanted to do a horror film because it was gonna be like one of my last films for that year of school. So I wanted to, cause I like doing horror films. So I was trying to think of like a good horror person. And I figured because John Wayne Gacy has like all the clown stuff, he'd be really fun to do. And you can incorporate a lot of cool clown stuff into it. Yeah, I mean, you, you play around with those images a lot, right? I mean, in the, the clown like iconography, both with the makeup and then all the shadows. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of just that visual approach and how, I mean, the film almost feels like memory unspooling because it's it's non-linear, it's like free associational. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, so because I only had three minutes to like, like I think up to five minutes to have the film, I was trying to make it like convey as much like information about, because I never mentioned that as John Wayne Gacy in it. 
like until like the very end. So I was trying to make it seem like it was John Wayne Gacy in that short amount of time without just saying like his name is John Wayne Gacy. So I feel like that influenced the style a lot of the film. For sure, yeah, like withholding all that information and did like kind of like a building sense of tension. Absolutely. Um, Rain, I was wondering, so for your film, like how, what is, where did this interest in true crime come from? How long is, has this like been a fascination of yours for a long time? Um, yeah, if you could just talk about that influence over your work. Yeah, I think um, I am really interested in true crime. And it's, um, I was kind of also interested in like, um, why are women specifically so interested in true crime? Because I was watching a TED talk where it talked about how specifically um, in terms of violent content uh, for fiction, men are the main consumers, but then when it comes to true crime, women are the main consumers and it kind of explored um, why is that? And uh, some of the explanations for that is it's like um, a self-defense mechanism where if you know enough about something, you can protect yourself from it. Uh, and so in this case, I'm like, okay, so how could that present itself? And so like in my film, the true crime like fan is in theory a better murderer than the murderer is. And it's like her knowledge that ends up um, saving her in the end. Absolutely. And so as we're talking about sort of, you know, uh, preoccupations or like, you know, things on people's minds, um, what, uh, led to this fascination with eels for Blue Zenith. Um, it's, I mean, I know it's sort of a, a simple question, but it's just like eels, like where did this come from? Like I, I was so shocked when I watched it. Um, and so, yeah, it was just felt like an invasion of the new in my head. So like, where, where did this idea come from? Um, there's this, a, uh, there's a modern trend of, of introverts just kind of like, you know, staying in their home and boarding themselves up and only occasionally poking their heads out and looking around. And, um, and I thought we'd like, you know, find a good analog for that, you know, in the animal kingdom. I, th I think um, we also touched on it a bit in one of the lines from my character talking about like they're slippery and slimy and they sort of just like crawl around at the bottom of the sea, keep to themselves for the most part. And I think that um, as far as for our character, uh, that was him. Like he's a sort of introverted guy, kind of voyeuristic, watches the world go by around him. And if you just like think about the creatures in the sea, you have these like colorful fish, like beautiful turtles and animals and stuff like that. And then you have an eel, which looks like it, it doesn't really belong in, in that space. So at least for me, that's kind of how I viewed our, our character as that just kind of like a slimy dude that doesn't doesn't fit in <laughs> with the rest of the fish. <laughs> <laughs> totally, for sure. Yeah, I guess I hadn't like considered that, the, the idea of like eels being like an extremely solitary like species of fish. I, I mean, this kind of relates to an audience question that we had come in um, about, you know, just in prepping for the film, like what did you learn about eels? Did you, do you feel like you came out on the other side being experts on eels in any way? I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, Nathan. I per personally, I, I didn't, we watched a lot of eel movies, like footage of eels, like National Geographic and stuff like that. But I, I can tell you what a moray eel is, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, part of the research process was like learning about the different kinds of eels and stuff. And I, at least for me personally, I'm a, like big into fishing and I grew up fishing a lot and have caught a lot of eels over the years. So I guess it was kind of I was like familiar with the eels and like what they are, like what they feel like, what they taste like <laughs> too. So like in terms of what we learned about when we were prepping for the film, I learned where in Chicago to buy eels. Um, I would hit up a, there, I forgot what it's called. Oh, it's Park to Shop. In Chinatown, they sell like two species of live eels that you can get there. Um, I learned a new recipe for cooking eels thanks to our editor because <laughs> we use, we did use a, a real a real eel for that. Um, the sequence uh, in the water. So then, yeah, we, we, we ended up eating it after the shoot, so. 
that's what I learned about eels, I suppose. <laughs> well, it's a yeah. That's particularly interesting that you were able to you feast on the eel after his spirited performance um, in the film. Um, well, so Max, let's let's talk about Hollow. Um, you know, you're there's a lot of different things I thought about while watching Hollow. Um, it, you know, I had mentioned that it it kind of has like this like Lynchian aura to it, at least in the sense that it has like this preoccupation with like, there's like all these like electricity noises. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you're also, I don't want to like reduce your vision just to those influences because I do think it's extremely unique, but to talk about a little bit, you know, your film is very dark. It's not mm -hmm. afraid of true black, right? It's not like yeah. they're, they're like dark, dark shadows. Um, yeah. If you could talk about just sort of your vision in general for the film and like your approach to photography. So the reason I mentioned earlier that um, there was supposed to be a murder taking place in the house is because um, the film is mostly supposed to be about um, the haunted house as kind of an archetype. I really like haunted locations as sort of a metaphor for the um, lingering trauma of a place or even um, the extension of a person's psyche on a haunting. You know what I mean? Like. I guess some of my major influences in that regard were Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House and um, the Jack Clayton film The Innocents, which is based on Turn of the Screw. The uh, candelabra scene was kind of a reference to that film, like the layered fades and stuff. And in terms of that, I was trying to kind of capture a very gothic aesthetic. And so the the true blacks and the very dark colors, or like lack of color, really fed into that. Um, a lot of the reason that I chose to have such deep shadows and stuff is because we were just filming it like in our house. And so it was just like our normal house. So that didn't look very scary on its own. So we kind of had to um, utilize like sort of spotlight lighting, almost film noir-esque, uh, like that part in the bathtub. I bought um, black tablecloths off of Amazon and just lined them up around the thing. And then we had like a softbox light shining in from above in order to get that really, like, uh, I guess, oppressive kind of look. Great. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was very curious, specific, like, how did you do the, especially then, like, some of that underwater footage, what, like, practically, like, how did you approach that challenge? So the underwater part, um, my phone is waterproof. So I, I was just filming it on my phone, and we have a pool in our backyard because we live in Florida. Um, it was December when we filmed it, though, so it was really, really cold. And so I was just like standing in the in the pool for a long time, waiting for my sister to jump in. And then I'd like get under the water right before she jumped in and try to film it. And then we just had like a lighting source coming in from above so we could get that like reflection where, you know, she kind of goes in and then there's the reflection of her on the surface of the pool from under. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like the, I like the water like bathtub motif. I like sinking like kind of Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, that scene where she's in the bathtub and then she falls down into it. Yeah, it almost feels like kind of like falling into a, like a liminal space, you know, like in between, like, yeah, the, exactly. like a floating sensation. Well, I guess, you know, talking about haunted locations, right? That's a huge aspect in in Wendigo, the, this idea of like history and a history of trauma and haunting. Um, you know, I guess, what were some of, you know, you mentioned an influence with The Shining, but maybe you could talk about um, creating that world and creating that history of a haunted space for Wendigo. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I think the location sort of helped that it's super isolated just in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I like, I really like those sort of log cabins with like the stone foundation um so i yeah i mean I, I think it's like the inside is very different from the outside because the inside is sort of like a baroque um you know like ornate wallpaper and stuff and then the outside is just sort of a you know like a log cabin so i think um i think all that and some of the hallways kind of intersect and stuff so it's just um, yeah, sort of a weird space inside. Sure. Um, 
you know, when we're talking about design choices, right? So you're talking about like the look of the cabin and the like the you know it's sort of like production design for animation. I'm very curious about the design um, of Swipe Right for Murder and its use of color. I mean, obviously, particularly the color red. Um, I feel like it's deployed in very clever ways. I mean, naturally her room is quite red with all the strings, but then there are shots where it'll be quite dark and you'll notice like the red handle of a, of a knife. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about um, just the overall production design and your approach to, to color in the film. Yeah, for sure. So um, I worked really closely with my production designer, Savina Monopoly. Uh, and from the beginning we want, like, I feel like usually in my films we have, we try to like limit the color palette a lot. So with this one, we really wanted fo to focus on reds and greens. And yeah, so having a lot of like those big pops of reds and then the contrast of like the green of her dress and some of the other, um, things in the room. Uh, one of the big things with the production design that I wanted was the, um, the murder board that kind of became 3D and like pinned across the room because uh as their conversation go as like at first you think that he's trapped her and we kind of wanted this imagery of him getting caught in her spider's web uh and we also just thought it would look interesting and yeah we were also very influenced like even the name swipe right for murder is like a callback to like dial m for murder the hitchcock film and we did kind of like style some of our visuals and costumes and things after some older uh, thrillers and horrors that we found inspired us. Yeah, I think um, I like the connection of the web, right? Like the the act of getting like caught in it. And it does feel like you're doing that with the camera too, like in, in sort of the sense of like the, the way it's like all designed across the scope frame. Um, it's very impressive. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, so Sel, a, a couple of these films in the program have some really wild practical effects and the challenges related with that. So I was wondering for, for Naish, uh, the creating the creature and just those, you know, with the, the, the nails and all those other elements of the practical effects. Um, well, what were some challenges involved with that or how did you sort of design all of that? Well, there was very little money. <laughs> so we just had to use um, what we could. Um, I think for the design, I, I, I sort of leaned more to my um, um, makeup artist. Um, she was amazing. Uh, she came up with all sorts of crazy little drafts for what it could look like because it's in the folklore, but no one's ever seen what it looks like. <laughs> People just talk about it. So we, we had to make our own version, literally. Um, so we knew we, we really wanted the, the glowing um, and the horns as well. Um, and for the glowing, it was just uh, simple, you know, get the, those UV paints and the UV light, boom. Um, and then the horns, uh, I forgot what we did. Um, those were actually weren't the initial horns. The real horns uh, were in our, our Grips car, and that car got robbed, and then the horns were taken too. So we had to, <laughs> we had to make some other horns on the side quickly. Um, that's why I, I think the ones you see in the film are just large and bulky. They were made very quickly. <laughs> Um, and um, for me personally, you know, I, I really like practical stuff, practical effects. I, I, I don't like sort of uh, visual, you know, too much CGI. Blah. So I, uh, we limited that just simply to the eyes um, for the creature. Um, but everything else is, is all practical. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way, you know, practical effects, like, there's something just so tactile about it that um, is extremely effective. And I felt that throughout all of Tame Inkara. Um, the And I'm a particular fan of body horror, so just that transformation um, was, was really exciting. Um, you know, talking some extreme body horror, but more self-inflicted, um, what were some of the challenges for Blue Zenith with those practical effects? I mean, just sort of like, <laughs> I mean, the scene on the boat is just so incredible and the, the way it's, um, yeah, it's just the design of it is, is so impressive. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you approach the challenge of um, having someone completely dismember themselves on screen.
Oh, uh, Nathan. Is... Now I think Better? I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that I was considering, and I remember talking to Jacques about this a lot, was um, I'm pretty inspired. I'm very inspired by a lot of Korean cinema, especially because I just like grew up with it. And I think one thing that you see a lot is in things like um, I Saw the Devil or Old Boy. There, are, I think that there are a lot of like clever ways that you can go a little bit over the top of the violence. And I think that that's something that kind of intrigues me. So when we first started talking about it, I actually wanted to do more and have it be a little bit more flashy, um, kind of like the like a Rube Goldberg type deal. Where like I almost envisioned it as something like getting toppled over, setting off one thing that like drops a weight that will like send like a a guillotine type blade down that'll just like take his legs off. Um, but our budget was like basically zero. I don't think we've even gotten reimbursed for like the hundred bucks that we spent on it at this point. <laughs> um, so yeah i guess we settled for whatever we could find in the shed that was at the location and we found those shears and there was a lawnmower in there and i remember we wanted to do a shot of the lawnmower blade spinning um for for like the arm removal in the shed um but obviously it's kind of dangerous to prop up a lawnmower and have the blade spin in your face while you get a shot of it so settled for a little bit of a a workaround thanks to our editor anna um and just did it with sound yeah wow yeah i mean yeah certainly a lawnmower would have been uh, a bit <laughs> risky <laughs> to made the right move there um i you know ella i wanted to talk about the the look of your film did you it, it seems like a film that's like pretty i don't know i guess you could say intricately composed and i was wondering if did you do storyboards for it or was it something things you just discovered like as you were shooting on set? If I didn't do any storyboards. It was more when I was going through and editing. I kind of wanted to, like, the all the clips I had kind of made it seem like a trailer into John Wayne Gacy's life. So I kind of wanted to, like, do, try and create kind of a trailer for his life because I thought that'd be interesting. Sure, I could definitely see that. Like, the idea of, um, like here's a quick look and in, into the like the way this this guy sort of lives <laughs> can you i mean i was wondering uh, about the way you directed them too and just working with the actors um yeah i mean because it's you know it's clearly a bit intense i was wondering how you sort of directed um the actor playing john wayne gacy and the child and like the way they interact with each other on screen so the actor playing John Wayne Gacy is one of our family friends. So it's very like easy to get him to do whatever, like he's been in other films that I've made and the child's my brother. So um, it's, it was easy. Like they were able to do a lot of stuff because they already had like, it wasn't just a straight, two strangers meeting each other. So it made it a lot easier for them to act and it made them a lot calmer around each other. Yeah, that certainly does help. Um, yeah, I may, you know, we're talking about siblings here. I, I've also like, um, I found the same thing, like when I was making films and like middle school and high school, like often using my sister, um, to perform in, in films and, and Max for hollow, you do the same thing, right? You have your, your sister as the lead. Yeah. She's um, the yeah. I was wondering, yeah, well, yeah, the soul star of the film. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about directing your sister and sort of, like sharing your ideas of the project with her and how she made sense of it all. So um, BB and I have been, well, B and I have been making films together since she was about five years old and I was like eight or nine. So we've been at it for a really long time and she is very used to me bossing her around on set. Um, and so in, in the case of Hollow, I think we, for, we filmed it in like four sessions um, and there were, <laughs> a lot of times where she would be really annoyed at me um, and she wouldn't want to film or, you know, and that actually made the performance better because you can kind of uh, see a lot of the, I guess, frustration and um, high emotion on her face at certain points. Um, and a lot of people have told me that her performance is like really, really good. And um I think that you know it came through 
pretty well in that regard. In terms of like what I'd actually say to her, um, a lot of it, since there wasn't any dialogue or anything like that, a lot of it was just blocking and certain actions and stuff like that. The hardest shot to pull off was probably the part where she has like the candelabra and she's walking to the TV um, because it wasn't meant to be picked up and so the candles kept falling off or like the TV would shut off or things would go wrong. So we had to redo it like five or six times. And um, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, bringing up the TV, I was curious, you know, without giving away all of your secrets, like how you created um, just the look of the static and like the television snow. Um, Cause at first I, I was sort of just thinking you were shooting the TV itself, but then there's all these other like shapes and like houses mm -hmm. and things that come up. Um, was that all done digitally? What was your approach to that? Yeah, I just did that in the editing process. A lot of that whole sequence um, sort of, it, it was planned, but when I was filming it, I sort of gave myself a lot of room for improvisation in terms of the editing. So there's a lot of space to play around with uh, layering and different effects and stuff. Um, I got into like After Effects when I was really, really young. So I have a decent skill set for that kind of thing. So I can just play around and, and try to experiment and, and see what works in that regard with like the TV stuff. Gotcha. Well, then, you know, related to that for our other Macs for Wendigo, um, and this is relates to an audience question we have where they say, you know, the, got very unique animation and how did you decide on that style? Um, related to that, if you could then talk about um, just the practical approach to your animation, because it is quite unique. Um, it seems like there's like a lot of like depth to it, even though it almost feels like paper, like people are like very flat, um, but the actual space in the film feels like it has a lot of depth. So I was curious if you could talk about the the way you sort of created that. Yeah, well, my workflow for, I guess, like creating a shot was um, I'd sketch it out first on paper and then uh, ink it, like with a fountain pen and ink, and then scan it in and then digitally color it and then cut it out. And then I could sort of place it in the 3D environment as a like a flat object. So they are like in essence just a, a flat object that's, you know, if there's someone, you know, they're just getting closer or further away. Um, so yeah, it was pretty time consuming. I ended up doing a lot more drawings than I thought I was gonna have to. Um, yeah, but I, I, uh, I sort of like the contrast between the sort of semi-realistic um, 3D backgrounds and the sort of paper cutout characters. Yeah, I mean, that's what struck me the most when I first encountered it too. And, and also the voice acting. I mean, we've been talking a bit about, you know, working with performers and how we found these people. Um, yeah, who, where, how did you come across these, these voice, voice actors for the film? Did you already know them or? Yeah, I pulled some favors. So the, the uh, old man who owns the bed and breakfast is my grandfather who lives in Milwaukee. And uh, so, yeah, he was really happy to do the lines. He's done some voice work before. And then uh, the the sort of newcomer to town, um, I just got a friend of the family to do some voice work. That's great. I, I knew it. it. It had to be someone that was from Wisconsin doing the voice of the grandfather. It was like a, such a distinct, you know, tone to the voice. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, so we've got a couple more audience questions here. Um, Rain, I was, you know, there's someone who asks, you know, what do you think is scarier, online dating or serial killers? And I think that that's a question that sort of gets posed in your film. <laughs> Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. <laughs> See, I feel like that depends on the person that you're asking. Um, you're never going to find me on an online dating website, but I do think, I. I feel like it's a, well, a lot of my friends think that I could be a serial killer. I have done some self-reflection and I think that I would actually like a big dream of mine would be to catch a serial killer. Um, yeah. So I think like I would want an interaction with a serial killer. I would not want to try online dating. <laughs> sure. Cool. Those are I mean, unique goals. I'm, 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 I'm glad. <laughs> um, another fun audience question, and this is something I was wondering about, is related to Taming Kara. And, you know, we talked a little bit about your, your practical effects. Um, 
but can you talk a little bit about those sound effects too um, and how you sort of like created those for the creature and, and everything? That I have to uh, give credit to my sound designer, uh, Michael Smith. It was just incredible. I think 50% of them are made by him. Uh, that's just him on the microphone going like, <laughs> and just, <laughs> just going crazy. <laughs> yeah, we sat um, for hours uh, just, just uh, gobbling and making all sorts of weird noises. And then, you know, you throw on all sorts of effects. It goes back to that, um, to the issue of no one's seen this thing, so no one knows what it sounds like or what it looks like. So we have to totally just just make it up, I guess. <laughs> yeah, in a way that fits with the story. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I love when I hear about people just like kind of making noises into a microphone, and then the, the, like the, that's what I was hearing on screen. <laughs> you know. Um, so I want to circle back a little bit to Blue Zenith and um, the ending of your film. It, when I first watched it, you know, maybe this is just speaking to my own like psychosis or insanity. But when when I saw it, you know, I I felt all these like a collision of tones, right? Like it's horrifying. Um, it's like kind of funny. But p personally, when I watched it, I also like found it a bit beautiful um, and freeing. Just the fact that like there here was this guy who like finally where was he wanted to be. Um, and especially since you're shooting it at the sea and it like, I don't know, the, the images open up a bit. And I was wondering if you could talk about that collision of tones and if that was something you were thinking about when kind of reaching that crescendo in the film. Yeah, so um, originally uh, it was written as a dark comedy. So there is something, uh, it, it was almost a parody of um, campfire horror stories. Um, and, uh, and just like absurd body horror. It's a lot of experimenting with theater of the absurd. And especially when it climaxes to, in the end, he is exactly where he wants to be. But there is something, there is something I think inherently comedic in a person that wants to be an eel cutting off all of their limbs and then jumping into the water only to drown and die. Um, so that, that was the, um, the comedy component, but um, there is, there is a kind of romanticism in, in that for all he knew he succeeded. Yeah. I, I remember when we were um, first working out the story and writing it, Jacques was a little bit uh, more on the, the side of making it a dark comedy and how the ending is um, supposed to be more of like a humorous, like it's so absurd that this guy wants to be an eel and he goes to the extent that he literally cuts off his legs and jumps in the water and thinks, yeah, I'm an eel. Like I made it. And the, he's like really blissful about it. Um, and then I think I was a little bit more on the side of uh, the, him like being liberated and like, regardless of what it, whatever it was that he wanted to do, like taking the agency upon himself to do it, even like, regardless of how crazy that dream was. So I'm glad to hear that. I guess like both of those things were coming across uh, in the end. Yeah, they, they, they certainly were. Um, yeah. And, you know, all of your films uh, had like a really unique effect on me. So, you know, as we're nearing the end of our time here, I just wanted to thank you all for, for sharing your films with Cine Youth. Um, it's a quite an eclectic program and you all have some really remarkable visions of both horror, the genre and just the world in general. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone so much um, for being here for this Q and A. And then I hope everyone watching enjoyed the films and has a chance to check out some other short film programs at Cine Youth through the coming week. So thank you, Thanks everyone. Absolutely. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.